Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another dish y'all to give you a Thursday night hangout. Yo, 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 yo. Ladies and gentlemen, I, of course, am your host, Charlie, and I'm joined once again by the prolific cover himself, Zinios. Word up, yo. Sup. Ladies and gentlemen, this, of course, is the Thursday Hangout. This is a live weekly show where we try our best to cover the topics most important to you during our show. If you haven't submitted your topic or question at any point during the show, please drop it into the chat. If you have any opinions on any of the topics we bring up, drop it in the chat so we can add your voice to the show. If we unfortunately do run out of time to cover all the topics, have no fear. It will be added to the list for next week and will be at the top of said list for next week. Indubitably. All right, so, so to jump right in, uh, let's start with um, the the fun uh, info that Blizzard dropped, Zelius. So basically, so a lot of services have two-factor authentication. No problem. It's standard, good security. But what Blizzard has also put into their two-factor authentication, which will be required for all of their services, is that prepaid plans and VoIP numbers will not qualify, which means things like prepaid from, say, Walmart or Cricket Wireless, which a lot of people actually use because they're affordable, um, are not valid SMS authenticators. So there is a not insignificant portion of players who basically will be adversely affected by this new SMS policy. Um, and I get it because on one hand, it is to battle against basically Smurfs and security and all that good stuff. Um, but the other hand, as you often see with um, overhanded security measures, it is also adversely affecting a number of players whose cell phone number is a legitimate number that they use for their carrier uh, it's basically not valid. It also means, like, let's just say you're maybe an expat or maybe you're military overseas or any plethora of circumstances where prepaid phones are perfectly legitimate uses of phones that may also uh, get the kibosh and not work on this service, too, which makes it all the more fun. And now why would they hesitate to allow for these prepaid phones and VoIP numbers? I mean, the whole idea is is if you're a overzealous Smurf, you could get a VoIP number or a prepaid phone number to basically create a Smurf account and then use an, that number with it. Um, but I would argue that somebody who really wants to be like, that's a whole lot of extra effort to put into being a Smurf. Um and you've already kind of raised the bar a lot by requiring the two-factor authentication in the first place. I think personally, like putting down to kibosh on VoIP numbers, which are super popular. I don't know if Blizzard realizes that because um, a lot of people have basically phone without cellular service because Wi-Fi, yep. uh, especially in much more dense populated areas, is everywhere. Like, I mean, I remember when I was in Europe, like, Five, 10 years ago, I didn't have cell service, but everywhere I was had Wi-Fi. So it was not an issue not having cell. And I used Google Voice on my phone using just the built-in Wi-Fi. And I had zero issues getting a hold of anybody I needed to while I was over there. Um, so a lot of places, it makes perfect sense. I mean, hell, think about it. If you work from home, you might not even need cell service if you have Wi-Fi because you can just use your phone on Wi-Fi working from home. Yep. But there's a lot of... Valid use cases, especially in 2022, where Wi-Fi is everywhere. Um, I mean, certain self-services, like they advertise like, hey, connect to our AT&T Wi-Fi that's everywhere when you have our phone. Um, I know that kind of feeds the purpose of that because cellular through AT&T, but the point is Wi-Fi is everywhere. Um, and same thing with like Cricket Wireless is one of those prepaid phones, but I think it's like 30 or 35 bucks basically for unlimited. Um, I know servers and shit can be spotty, but it's a hell of a deal. So it makes sense why, especially the prepaid phones, that a lot of people have those because they're affordable and make economic sense. Um, so I personally think it's a bit overhand, um, a bit heavy handed to implement that type of requirement in the battle against Smurfs 
at the cost of alienating a good number. There's and people have um, submitted refunds for Overwatch Two because they will no longer be able to play it um, because of this. Speaking of Overwatch Two, uh, for those who are still going to go forward and play it, um, there are they just released the information set around uh, the preloads. Uh, if you have the console, uh, you can start preloading Overwatch 2 at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on October 4th, which is actually the release date, so that's not really all that. Yay! Mm -hmm. um, but if you have the PC version, uh, that starts on September the 30th at 1.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, uh, which does make sense because that gives you... Uh, shit, I can't remember. Does September have 30 or 31 days? I think it's 30. I, I think I it's remember. 30. So that gives you four days or five, four and a half days to download all the stuff that you need so you can play it as soon as it becomes active. I'm going to be honest. Like, I'm not planning on playing Overwatch 2 anytime soon. Um, it's not because there's nothing they've announced that, like, oh, I'm not interested. It's just I'm not interested in general. I'm just like, meh. Oh, Zelius. Maybe someday. But Maybe. that day is not in the next, like, six days. Well, there you go. Um, now, the, the interesting thing is that there was uh, some additional information coming out of Blizzard, not around two-factor authentication or Overwatch 2, but around the upcoming uh, expansion for World of Warcraft, Dragonflight. Ooh. And that is, ladies and gentlemen, if you thought uh, Resurrection Sickness sucked before, oh, buddy, they are, they're up in the ante. At least that was my interpretation. I'm going to read it to you just in case I misread. But basically, um, in the past, uh, after you died, the previous death penalty was 25% durability lost on items and a 10-minute of Resurrection Sickness debuff. Okay, and that debuff was like some sort of percentage on all your stats. Was that right? All your attributes. I don't know what else it would be. It makes sense. Now, uh, when Dragonfly comes out, um, when you respawn at the Spirit Healer, this is, of course, it's all about responding at the Spirit Healer instead of walking back to your body. Yep. Now, Resurrection Sickness will result in a 50%, not 25%, but a 50% durability loss with equipped items. Damn. But, but, um, instead of the 10-minute uh, debuff, it will be a one-minute debuff where all your attributes have been reduced by 75%. So it's like, Forcing you to take a one minute timeout, basically. Yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. One minute timeout plus you all your dirt half of the durability that's on your items are. It's interesting. I mean, versus like most MMOs I've been playing for a while now, basically have no death penalty. Um, they might have like a durability thing, but like really for the most part, most MMOs are like, oh. You died. Resurrect. Maybe pay a few copper to repair your items if you even have durability. Life goes on. No. Like, yeah, go on. The the reason why they're doing this, or apparent, the apparent reason is that they didn't want to use the spirit healers as kind of like a, a quick teleportation for uh, players to get around. Which I get, but like with mounts and shit, like how big of a deal is that really? I don't know. Blizzard seems to be just, you know, they're playing, they're doing amazing today or this week. No, what I remember is we went back in vanilla, what you'd have to do, because there was quest, mm -hmm. like, say, like, go fetch this treasure chest in a cave, right? Yep. It would be behind, like, four elites. And back in vanilla, wow, like, you weren't defeating those on your own. Like, that just wasn't how it was developed. Mm -hmm. And so you would do res runs, meaning, like, you get like 75% of their die. You went up rest of the spirit healer. You go back to your body. 
You get like as far to the treasure chest as possible, resurrect and continue to run while the mob hit you and died over and over. Might take you a couple of times, but eventually get to that treasure chest. Was definitely a thing back in the day. I'm pretty sure it probably still is a thing. Because you could still run back to your body. Yeah. Um I don't know. That's interesting because like Guild Wars 2, there's like no penalty for death, I think, that I remember. Um and same thing with um Final Fantasy 14. There's a penalty if you get rest and battle mm-hmm. for like 60 seconds, but like outside of that, it's like, oh no, you died. Go get back into the fight, basically. I don't know, because like to me, like resurrection said this is kind of dumb because it's like you've already died. Like, so whatever progress you're trying to make is already been halted. What's the point of making it like more onerous and basically unfun to the player? Because we're here to have fun, right? Right. So you've already lost that progress. To me, resurrection sickness like that just doesn't make it fun almost, if that makes sense. Like that's what it takes away from. So it's like a know. it's like a further penalty for dying. It's like on top of dying, we're 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 going to just stomp on you while you're down. Yeah. And like yeah, I don't know. That doesn't it's mm, whatever. I mean, I don't plan on playing World of Warcraft. So whatever. To me, it's like a meh. Yeah. So all right. Like I feel like at this point, like Blizzard needs to do everything they can to like make the players happy to come back to World of Warcraft. How about just make the players happy for any of their products? <laughs> I know okay, that's that's, yeah. that's a weird ask, but you know, make the consumer happy might benefit. But microtransactions make you happy by spending money. Yeah. We yay microtransactions. Oh. Anyways, so that's all I got for Blizzard. Now let's talk about a uh, another game company. Who has finally, 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 finally decided to officially kill off its uh, game streaming service. Oh, no. Zealous, which game streaming service are we talking about? Well, it can't possibly be the Google Stadia because just a couple weeks ago, there was a rumor that Google's killing off Stadia and Google came out and emphatically denied those claims saying they were investing more resources than ever into the studio because it's such a popular and robust gaming system. Right. With the exception of uh, the fact that they did close their only internal studio like last year. Yeah. So what Charlie's alluding to is Google came out officially today um, and is officially confirmed slash announced um, that the Google studio will officially be laid to rest and no longer function as of January 18th, 2023. Now, the interesting thing about these, so most services and products, like it closes down and you're basically just SOL, right? It's Mm -hmm. done. Well, sucks to be you. So what I will give at least Google credit for on this is that they are issuing full refunds um, for the um, hardware purchases um, made through the Google Store and for any gaming t- gaming content purchased through the Stadia Store. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, that's actually kind of interesting. So like, for instance, like if you purchased their gaming um, controller, which you can use on your PC because this is Bluetooth, you basically got that for free, so to speak. Yep. Um, so it is interesting. So they're not, though, they're not... Um, refunding the subscription service if you did that which i kind of get that though because like a subscription is kind of month to month so i can understand that actually not um giving back money for a subscription that i actually am like okay that's fair um so yes so as charlie mentioned google invested supposedly money into a um development studio who they shut it down pretty damn quickly um and I'm just going to quote a line here from Ars Technica, which I think very well sums up, to me at least, I think a lot of people out there, 
one of the biggest issues with the stadia in general, and that is Google's damaged reputation made the death of the stadia a self fulfilling prophecy. Mm-hmm. No one buys stadia games because they assume the service will shut down, and stadia is forced to shut down because no one buys games from it. Mm-hmm. And I think when it was announced, like Trolley and I kind of said the same thing like, hey, give me a year or two if it's still around, maybe I'll look at it. But I mean, how many of us have been bit in the ass in the previous, you know? What the hell is Google Meet anymore? Like, is it Google Chat? Is it Google Hangout? Nobody actually knows anymore. Um, and that's just what Google does, is they randomly, like, shut, like, change what a platform name is, how to access it, or they just kill it, and, like, ha-ha, sucks to be you. And this is, they've put it perfectly as a self-fulfilling prophecy, because when it came out, we're, like, I was of two minds. One is, if Google really invested the money into it, which Lord knows Google has free money coming out the wazoo from their ad services, yep. it can be a phenomenal service. And from what I've read, if people actually used the Stadia as a streaming service, they were happy with it. Like everything I've read was actually good service. Maybe not potentially for like really competitive FPS games. There was some lag, but especially like first person games, I heard it was a great service actually. So, Google, when it comes, and that's what's so frustrating, when they actually put a product out, usually it's actually from a technical perspective, a good product because um, they have good developers. Mm-hmm. I mean, they just do. But it's almost like developers come up with this pipe dream for like, we'll be the coolest service ever. They put it out and all of a sudden it's like the bean counters come in. We're like, holy shit, how are we going to make money off of this? And the developer's like, I don't know. I just made it for the last four years and Shazam, it's out. It's not my problem anymore. And the bean counter's like, well, if it doesn't make money within six months, we're going to close it down. Oh, well, I don't care. Like, that's literally what it feels like. No, nah, that's, you know, that's, that you're giving, that's way too much credit for Google. It's like, <laughs> hey, we're going to do this uh, for a bit. And if we get bored, well, will shut it down. Google Plus, Google Wave, half of Google Voice. Uh, Google Hangout, which is now Google Meeting. And like, I used to like, I'll be, I mean, I used to be a Google fanboy. Like all my shit was through Google. Yep. And now I'm like, yeah, I'm not doing anything through Google now. Cause it's like. Here today, gone it, tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Like at some point it'll be shut down most likely because that's what Google does. Unless it's, unless it's basically Gmail um google suite so the stuff they have like in the cloud like for um education business um for now i mean literally seriously d- d- like they, they can shut down of, tomorrow like i know a lot of businesses are actually eschewing um google suite in favor of actually microsoft um office because mm-hmm. microsoft has put a lot of development into basically making their cloud pretty freaking similar because it's office 365 to basically be just like your native word app. Yep. Um, so I could see that becoming more, it used to be totally Google sweep. I actually see that becoming more office 365 um, just from what I've seen. So you're right. Like I don't think Gmail shut down because of ad services because they get ad money, but Google sweep, honestly, who knows? Um, you're right. Like a couple of years ago, I would have been like, no chance in hell, but now it's because the problem is, I mean, I've been using Google Suite for years. Mm-hmm. They have not improved it like whatsoever in like the last number of years. Like it's the same exact product you got five years ago. Yeah. Um, whereas like Microsoft is making like Microsoft Word on Office better in the cloud to make it basically like so you're right. I mean, I never thought it was possible, but who knows? So really basically. Gmail is not going anywhere. Ads are not going anywhere. And then they have YouTube because, and what you've seen on YouTube now is they've actually been piloting um, users getting up to like six ads per YouTube video. Dear God. Uh, Because of ad money. I mean, so basically Google's becoming a ad company. I know they've kind of been that way for a while. Um, but really, it's like it feels like that's all they are becoming, which sucks because remember Google's tagline many, many eons ago was basically do no 
evil was it or do no bad or something along those lines something along those but but to me, and, and this is this is really going to suck with this comparison but we're doing it anyways google is starting to ever inch towards ea when ea Ooh. was first out like in the er, er, uh, late 80s early 90s it was like the haven for creativity and innovation and video games and to to help out those smaller studios to get a bigger audience. And now EA's like, uh, we're doing sequels and we're going to microtransaction. Uh, we're going to make it uh, uh, online always. Uh, fuck new ideas. Let's uh, let's put paywalls everywhere. And yeah. let's 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 basically drag or basically grind everybody in the development industry into the ground because we need it tomorrow. <laughs> no, fuck tomorrow. We need it today. Yeah. And like, I actually have two, two Google voice products. Um, but who knows how long those will be around. Yep. Yep. I mean, yep. honestly, it's like, I feel like Amazon echo those won't be getting anywhere because people purchased it through that. So Amazon gets money off of it. So for Amazon, that makes sense. I I have the original Echo, by the way. Yeah. So I, I get Amazon staying around because yeah. that integrates with all their stuff. Okay. So so question for you. Uh, Google Stadia, of course, was the gaming, the stream, the game streaming service through Google. Yeah. But Amazon still has theirs, Luna. I am. I, to be honest with you, I keep forgetting that they have Luna. I actually forgot about that too because I remember I was reading some comments and people were like, "Oh yeah, the Amazon gaming service." I was like, "It's not bad." They have a gaming service? Yeah, it's not bad. Um, I feel like it's almost just like a pet project as a part of AWS. Yeah, I mean, that's really, to me that's like really what it comes down to. Um, that's a product that ain't going anywhere. Yeah, I like. AWS like runs the internet basically now. And it's funny when it shit breaks. Oh, when AWS breaks, you might as well just like go home for the day. Doesn't matter where you work. If AWS goes down, you're pretty much hosed. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um Yes, yeah, so it it it's crazy. Um it, it, the crazy thing to me about it too is like if you think about how much money I'm going to call it basically free money for the amount of development hours to put into it for all their ads. Yep. Same thing with YouTube. Like, I mean, all the money they get for advertising for basically other people's content. Um, and obviously doing something like Stadia cost development money, like hard money. But like the Stadia has to be like basically a rounding error of the overall profit margin for Google, really. And that's what's kind of interesting is some of these products – where it's like it wouldn't even affect the bottom line by keeping it active and developing it. That's what's always interesting to me. Yeah. No, but the the uh, the the interesting thing, or I guess the thing to keep an eye out on, is um, what happens to the Stadia exclusive games because there are a couple that are. Um, uh, They're gonna go to the Luna. Maybe I don't know. Uh, there's I'm trying to remember. There was one. That I that I was actually really interested in, but I can't remember what the name of it is now. Uh, let me see if we can find it real quick. Uh, it is called uh, Guilt. It's a third person horror game starring starring a young girl, uh, and which it was considered to many Stadia fans as possibly the best exclusive game released on the service. It was developed by Tequila Works and is about six hours long, packed with some decent jumps. Jump scares, puzzles, and combat. Nothing sp super special, but a solid game that will hopefully get ported to another system so that uh, fans can continue to enjoy guilt for years to come. Yeah, I think that's most interesting to me is it almost felt like Google jumped in thinking like this would be like an instant success, basically of their own gaming platform. But you think about it like, the gaming industry, it's a very entrenched industry from a console and PC perspective. Um, I mean, you got things like, you know, the Xbox and the PlayStation and um, Nintendo have been around for decades. Yep. And then you have 
Steam has been around forever. And even like your, we'll call them other game launchers like Origin and all that stuff. Like mm -hmm. that's because it's a own publishing studio who puts those out there. Yep. And even then a lot of those games are released alongside Steam. Mm -hmm. um, so it's almost like Google felt like they could just jump in and make instant success. But I think they underestimate that gamers, but I think I'm ignoring mobile phones for this, but gamers, like when it comes to like console and PC, like we get kind of entrenched in our own system and there's not really, you would have to be really convinced to basically move to a different platform. I mean, think about it. most people, like if they're on the PlayStation, by God, they're keeping that PlayStation console, you know, from PS4 to PS5 and so on and so forth. Same thing with the Xbox. I mean, I know PC Master Race is a meme, but it's also real. Uh, right. No, I mean, the, but and you're right. I mean, I think the thing is that um, what was this? First of all, the 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 one huge, humongous, always going to be present Achilles heel for a streaming service, although many developers and publishers are making this obsolete, is that you have to have an internet connection. Yeah. Now, what I mean by uh, by obsolete for the developers and publishers is that a lot of publishers are requiring that their games be online always, even if it's a single player game. So, ta-da. But the, the fact of the matter is that the game does reside on your computer instead of on, you know, in the mm -hmm. cloud. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's always going to be a hurdle that is really going to be difficult to deal with when you have like you know people who've always played their games through the the origin launcher or the gog launcher or uh steam or whatever launcher is star doc still a launcher or are they completely dead now i don't even know i, don't know. I just remember i got a bunch of free games because they shot the bed so hard on one of their games um but yeah Anyway. Oh yeah, that was like it was the one of the four X games. Yeah, it was uh, Just, Element, Elemental, the Land of Magic, or something like that. I have then, the I have the box, the collector's box, still somewhere in my house. So it was supposed to be the spiritual successor to Master of Magic. Yep, and it was Magic. absolute shit. And then they hired the head modder of like one of the Civ three add-ons. If I, I remember right, Civ four. It was Civ three or Civ four? Yeah, yeah, it was like Fallen Angel or something yep. or something on those lines. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, oh, that's a throwback. Yeah. Uh, I guess the other, another ironic part is now that I think about it, like Google. I mean, it's basically an ad company now. Mm -hmm. I don't remember honestly seeing many ads for the Google Stadia. No. Like it launched big, but like on Facebook, like for instance, I would have been the. I would have been like the target demographic for the stadia on Facebook ads. Yep. And really any social media in general, hell, even YouTube ads. I honestly don't remember seeing like any stadia ads now that I'm thinking about it. Well, I mean, the, 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 the facts about are it, one of the big things that it boils down to is what did the stadia ever have that you couldn't get anywhere else? And the answer was, not much. <laughs> I will say, I do think, so I think there's two issues. One is, when it was launched, mm -hmm. PC parts were getting really fucking expensive at the time. So at the yes. time, it actually made economic sense. Yep. And now we're back into, prices have really normalized by and large over the last couple of months. Yep. But I think the other and this is part of, you know, corporate culture in general, is just that short-term profit thinking. So if you think about a gaming, if you think about a hardware refresh, right? Mm -hmm. I refreshed my graphics card about a year ago, uh, but I've had my CPU for about, it was the first gen Ryzen. So I think I've had it like six or seven years. I have for a while. Um. And many gamers are kind of similar both. All the hardware will just say anywhere three to six years, depending on the refresh cycle. So if the whole idea behind the Stadia, which to me is actually not a bad premise at all, where you can have some cheap ass hardware and you can basically play it full resolution with the Stadia. It almost had to have been on production for like five, six years to get those gamers, because the only time to me getting the Stadia would have made sense is 
when I went to go refresh my PC, like, oh, you know what? Instead of spending, let's just say $1,000 on a PC, I could instead spend $400 on my PC. I could have the same functionality of like my daily work stuff. And really that extra $600 went for the, you know, the better CPU and graphics card to play video games. But now I can spend half of that on the Stadia and get the same quality of games. So I think if it had gone on for like a hardware refresh cycle from a gaming perspective, it actually could have gained traction. But I mean, what, Stadia was out like a year or two? Like, Oh, dude, no. <laughs> it's been up for a while. Has it? Yeah, hold on, let me see I, here. I just feel like it never was, to me at least, it was never... It never had enough advertising for me to even think about refreshing using that. Launched November 18th, 2019. Okay, so three years. So that would have been like just the beginning of a refresh cycle for the gaming players. Yep. Yep. So until you go with like a full like three to six year refresh cycle, like it's going to not gain traction. Like to me, just from a fundamental perspective, if anybody has a working PC, there was no incentive to go to the stadium at that point. It was only from a monetary perspective, because that's how gamers look at it, is what's kind of my cost-benefit ratio. I mean, that's most people in general. Until you're going to do that refresh cycle, why would I bother with an always-on device? Um, so then those other issues, it's just like that was like a 10-year investment to me yep. to actually see... It was going to happen, but obviously uh, that's not how Google or to be honest, most companies operate. Most companies aren't operating in that type of long term. No, we're being honest. No, they want instant gratification. And if they don't get it, they just cut their losses and move on to the next project. Yeah. So it'll be interesting because Stadia, I mean, Google's one of the big cloud providers. Who knows what the hell is going on with Luna? Um, so it's almost like the big, what could have been streaming devices for video games are kind of like, well, I guess Netflix is trying now, actually. Our, Netflix is doing some gaming stuff. That, so there's, you can get I, so, some like mobile games through the Netflix app. Is that which, what it is? Yeah. And, but, and I'm going to be honest with you. The games are pretty solid. I mean, the hmm. games that I've tried are, are, are fun. I mean, the, 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 the unfortunate thing is that. I don't stick with mobile games for very long. Yeah. Sure. Uh, the only mobile games that really stick around for any amount of time uh, are probably like word games. And that's not really what the Netflix games have. It's, you know, like they'll have a collectible card game or they'll have, you know, like a little adventure game or a small puzzle game. And it, it's, you know, it, nothing is when I've, when I've tried out those games, I think it's blown me away to the fact I'm like, Oh my God, everyone has to do this now. Mm. I mean, that's not happened to me. But yeah, I mean, yeah, well, I mean, the, it makes Netflix is unfortunately, I mean, they're, they're having to, they're, they're slashing, uh, their, their original, uh, program budgets because, yeah. you know, shit's expensive. And they still haven't talked about the next Sandman, which oh. makes me sad. But oh, well. I'm still waiting on the next season now. Of I finished last week was uh, Fate the Wink Saga. Ah, so now you now you've you're completely up to date on Fate. Yeah, well, on what's on Netflix? Yeah, right, right. Well, uh -huh. here's hoping that they give you another one. Uh, actually, uh, just. Uh, I'm almost actually done with season five of um, Stranger Things. Very good. Yes, it's uh, it's good. It's good. Yeah, it's very I mean, good. Obviously, I know people love it. Oh, it's, I love it. Oh, gosh, it's good. Yeah. Uh, anyways, um, okay. So, coming going from uh, digital games, let's let's do something. Let let's talk about an interesting thing that happens. It doesn't happen often, but it but it does happen on occasion. I want your opinion on this. There, because we now live in a digital marketplace, right? We're getting our games through a digital platform. Um, I can't tell you the last time I bought a physical copy of any game because if I'm going to play it on the Switch, I'm going to buy it through the Nintendo Store on my Switch. If I'm going to play something on my PC, I'm buying it through Steam. So what's interesting is there are some companies out there that 
after they have attained a certain level of success, they are then producing physical copies of their games, which I, to me it seems baffling. But I want your opinion, Zelius. It's almost like a sign of success if you make a physical copy of the game. And I think it's it's to feed on our nostalgia, honestly, mm -hmm. of physical disc. Um, a lot of bands do the same thing, if you think about it. It's, you know, they'll do particularly, it's like usually like a small run of CDs and LPs um, yeah. to really get the more hardcore fans. Um, so I get it. Like it's it's another revenue stream for them. So to me, that's cool. Um, well, because I do. I mean, I wish I still had. It's mm -hmm. still, you know, I don't hindsight twenty twenty and all that. Yep. Is the old civilization to um, technology tree that would take up like a quarter of your wall. I wish I still had that because you remember back in your old bonus oh. room, I had that right above it. You know, like it was just one of those cool things. Um, and kind of your point, nobody buys it. It's kind of, the, you know, it's the uh, self-fulfilling prophecy kind of where it's, if we're not going to buy physical products, mm -hmm. the developer or publisher is not going to invest the money or time into putting out great physical products because they're not going to make money off of it. Um, so I do think it is to me, at least then a bit of a nod to the fans. When you see a, I see it more from the bands I follow where they put out those physical products. I'm like, hey, you know, true real fans, they're going to buy this product because it's awesome. Any pleb can just go on, uh, you know, Pandora or um, Spotify and listen to it that way. But if you really care about us, you will buy the physical See, product. I think, I think, I mean, I mean, it's cool. I mean, I don't get me wrong. I mean, but at the same time, the way that video games are played now there's so many new video games coming out every single game day that I mean the game to me would have to be just absolutely earth shattering for me to have bought the digital copy and then played it and then played like I don't know 20 other games and then like hey by the way we're releasing a physical copy for me to go oh I'm on board I mean like so for music I get it because like yeah it's not like you get it's not like it's like oh we're uh releasing patch 2.5 of our song now with better drum sets right no it's but like games are always as we know they're basically always being perpetually updated yep so like I know consoles have a very set way of doing it where you know if you have a CD it's basically almost like downloading a CD installing it so I get it from a console perspective is it the same thing on the PC? I don't honestly know. Like the literally the last physical disc game I think I purchased was the orange box. Jesus. Uh, for, for the PC. Yeah. I, I'm trying to remember if I got overwatch on a physical disc. It would either would have been the or I can't remember if I have overwatch on physical. So it's either if it was not overwatch, then it would have been the orange box from a physical disc perspective. I don't even know what the the last physical PC game would have been for me. Because, ladies and gentlemen, I know it's going to come as a shock, but PCs no longer ha are sta uh, have standard CD or DVD or Blu-ray drives Wait. built in. Ha! Mine still has one. I've got an external one that I could plug in if push came to shove. But that's it. Honestly, someday, if I get a new case, the CD-ROM's going. It's just, it's been there for... A decade yeah. so it's like it's just there it's really a holdover from before usb drives worked for booting your os yeah um, now you can do it on a thumb drive oh yeah although what i should do is take like all my old games like nord in the realms and throw them onto like a iso so i can throw them onto like dosbox or something someday uh dosbox yes. yes i know Dream dreams that'll probably never actually happen, and that's okay. Yes. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I know that we were uh, we've been chit chatting about the uh, the stadia for quite a bit, but and and if now, of course, of the the digital to physical copy games. But I do want to stop or pause for a second and give a shout out to all those friends of the show. These are the amazing individuals that help Ultra Confusion continue to be Ultra Confusion. So, without further ado, I want to give a shout out to. 
The Indie Cluster. The Indie Cluster is an organization of independent game developers that want to gain exposure by being involved in the community. They collectively journey to popular conferences a traveling booth to help gain attention for their games. They make partnerships in the local community to bring games to the mainstream mindset. They highlight local, unusual, and rare concepts to challenge the paradigm of the common. They also host events to teach kids and minority groups about game development to hopefully one day enter the industry themselves. If you want more information, go to anycluster.com and buy an, Oh, by the way, they just had their, uh, annual fundraiser, which was last weekend. Yeah. Or last Friday. And it was an amazingly awesome time. Nice. Ladies and gentlemen, the next shout out we have to give is to noodle boy media. Founded in 2015 by Andrew Tran, Noodle Boy Media, previously Wack Kid 47 Media, is your choice for professional photo shoots and panel recordings at conventions. They pride themselves in providing a high level of professionalism, top notch experiences, and quality services. If you want more information and to view their full list of services, check out facebook.com slash Noodle Boy Media. Speaking of Noodle Boy, I saw he was actually doing um, camera work for the Hurricane Ike or Ida. Whichever I, it is. I, I, Ian, Ike, Iva, Ian, something. I don't know. Yeah. Her, the hurricane that's currently tearing or was current or was tearing up uh, Florida. It's still doing damage, isn't it? Yeah. What? Is it still doing damage? Uh, I think it's on. Yeah. I think still the eastern side, it's still definitely causing issues because it's all the winds and crazy shit. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the next shout out we have to give. Out is uh, Hero Chiropractic. Hero Chiropractic is a unique healthcare practice set up by Ryan Moore. The company's focus to elevate a patient's experience of freedom, creative expression, and joy. They believe that everyone can be a hero and has incredible heroic potential inside themselves waiting to be unleashed. Hero Chiropractic focuses on mobile chiropractic care in the greater Atlanta area. They are committed to healing clients by creating a plan of action uniquely suited for each person. They make that plan of action as convenient and affordable as possible and most importantly suited to your individual needs. For more information, go to HeroChiropractic.com. Yes. Now, the next one is the guy who helped us out in a pinch after our not copyrighted music became copyrighted. That, of course, is Crossbad Creative. Need a new logo or want to work on full branding and content strategy? Or maybe you need music or audio for your content, just like Alter Confusion. Crosspad Creative offers a whole host of solutions for individuals and small businesses. Just email Josh at crosspadcreative at gmail.com and see what he can do for you. Nice. The final shout out we have to give is to our longtime supporter for Alter Confusion and, of course, longtime friend of the show, and that, of course, is Agile Axiom. By day, Ax leads both a development team and a system administration team working with satellites at NASA's Goddard campus. But while not in meetings and many times during, he is the Agile Evangelist Agile X, championing the philosophy of Agile and trying to make the world a better place for software developers, testers, system admins, and software projects the world over. Decades of experience in software development and leading Agile teams are brought to bear against evil processes, ineffective work, and bad habits. For more information, go to agileaxiom.com. Wow. Now, uh, before we move on, I do want to point out that... Uh, we have successfully um, appealed our uh, audio claim against the Universal Music Studio from two weeks ago. That's right. Suck it. And uh, we did not have a music claim <laughs> this past week. So here's hoping that we don't have one after this show. <laughs> uh, should I start? We could start singing like a duet or something. Uh, n- I, I, w- I would slap the copyright claim on that series I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry but no uh ladies and gentlemen uh if you are if you are curious or want to be one of the friends of the show uh let me tell you something let me tell you how you can do that ladies and gentlemen alter confusion has a patreon page and that allows us to survive and love and support of fans like you patreon lets you the fans the lovers haters demigods interdimensional beings gods demons, aliens, supporters, and many more to become active participants of the work we love through a monthly membership. 
This membership gives you access to exclusive content, community, and insight into our creative process. In exchange, we gain a bit more freedom to do our best work and the stability we need to build an even stronger creative career. Currently, we have one, two, that's right, one, two, two levels that you can pledge at. They're both monthly subscriptions. One is a $1 a month or $12 a year uh, subscription. And what that gets you is early access to all of our playthroughs, as well as patron only posts and insight uh, to help shape the future of Alter Confusion. If you are feeling a little frisky and you want to pump it up from $1 to $5, that's $5 a month or $60 a year, not only do you get everything at the $1 level, but you also get your name or organization added to every single thank you section during Thursday night hangout. So if you want to become a patron of Alter Confusion, go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Alter Confusion today. Yes. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I do, this is something that always excites us and, and we will continue to support it until the bitter end. Ladies and gentlemen, for the 11th year straight, Alter Confusion will be participating in fundraising for Extra Life. Extra Life. Extra Life is gamers doing what they do best, game, to help sick and injured children at their chosen Children's Miracle Network Hospital. The money that we raise through Extra Life goes directly to Children's Healthcare of Atlanta as unrestricted funds. This means that the hospital decides where and how to spend the money to ensure the dollars we raise make the biggest impact in the lives of the kids they treat. So if you have the capacity to donate, please go to extra-life.org and search for Ultra Confusion today what about yesterday well if you've already, if you did it yesterday then i thank you for your donation yeah. all right ladies and gentlemen there's a couple there's still we still got a couple of stories to get to so let's keep going oh before i go any further ladies and gentlemen i want to point out that there is an, a phenomenal game designer out there and his latest um Kickstarter project has just gone uh, live in the p last couple days. I'm going to post the, the link in there, but ladies and gentlemen, Craig Campbell of Nurburger Games has decided that it is time to give you a taste of his latest game, and that, of course, is Code Warriors. Code Warriors? Code Warriors. Uh, and if I didn't close the stupid thing, I could tell you, uh, life in the system was simple. Every program had a job, and every job was important, or so it seemed. It was an ordered society that functioned well, or so it seemed. Then the collapse began. The system is breaking down. Chaos reigns. Apparents abound. The old structures are gone. Everything is falling apart. In some places, literally. Now you, a program, can be whoever, whomever, and whatever you want to be. And that's go a good thing because the system needs you. This may be the end. Will you say goodbye, world? Or will you fight for a new one? Code Warriors is a tabletop RPG where you portray a program living inside a computer world. The computer is crashing. It's the apocalypse. Think Tron meets Mad Max with a host of other sci-fi and apocalyptic inspirations thrown in. The stories you tell will sit around, center around survival, teamwork, the unknown, power and control, and rebuilding the world. But I don't see a tier level where you get to include your own character in the actual game or likeness. See, here's the thing. Craig has streamlined the shite out of this. So it would be sweet. And, and maybe there's like an add-on later. But for right now, they literally, he just wants to get this game into the hands of the amazing gamers out there. So I, of but course, have already pledged. And it's already been funded. A custom eight-sided dice in a custom ten. Or yeah, I did. Yeah, whatever the the highest one was, I I, I I'm already in. I, I got the physical book, the dice, and the ten. Huh. Done. So it's interesting. I haven't seen this before on many Kickstarters. Is there's a different tier for UK and EU versus US? Yep. Which I get is probably because of shipping and all that shit. So it makes sense. I and import like, expert. It's like that's interesting. I think it also has to do with where he where uh, all the uh, the stuff is being created. Yeah, that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, I highly recommend, because I've already done it, but I highly recommend that you 
join in the growing number of individuals who've already kickstarted this project. It's already funded. Uh, and enjoy the amazingness that is a Nerd Burger game product. Yes. And I love how I just picked up this 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 paper that's got all of like what I just read to you guys. Like it's got the the uh, the stories that we still have to go over. That does not have it. It's on this itty bitty little note card that I have. You have a little itty bitty note card. Yes. Okay. So the next story, actually. So, um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, I definitely am a Netflix subscriber, and I definitely have the uh, that autoplay feature turned on so that once an episode is over, it goes over to the next episode. I hate that. Now, here is an interesting thing. For those out there who have or are thinking about watching the Cyberpunk 2077 anime that is on Netflix, turn off the autoplay. The reason is that there are things, references, and, and other stuff that will occur during the closing credits that will be cut off because of that autoplay feature. That just makes me angry. It makes me want to throw my drink at my screen in frustration. It's and I will not. And a lot of there's there's quite a lot of anime out there that that yeah. do try to like give you stuff right at the end. But Netflix, I understand. They're they're trying to help you out so you don't have to like select next episode, next episode, next episode, next episode. Oh, it's so tough to press. Or or the the other alternative, which is what current Crunchyroll does, is it'll it basically plays the entire episode. Then once that episode's done, it'll give you a thirty second counter for it to start the next episode, which drives me nuts. <laughs> like, if if I'm still watching, at that point, once the credits stop, I don't need the thirty the additional thirty seconds. We are at the end. That the the playhead has hit the end. Just start the next episode. You know what actually drives me nuts is it's usually anime that do it. Where sometimes like post post credits they'll have like a little intro to the next episode. Yes. But it's not every episode. Yes. Yes. So it's like oh and then like I fast forward, I'm like, wait, did I miss the scene? Was there actually a scene? I don't nope. know. Oh, like it'd be like if, if like other. Marvel movies only did their after credit scene half the time or like mm -hmm. a quarter of the time. Yeah. So you're just sitting there in the theater going, okay, here we go, here we go. And the lights go up, and you're like, you son of a bitch. You got me. You, you got me. You did not leave. That was their plan. Oh, hello. <gasps> Speak of Marvel, I'm excited. Why? Deadpool 3. Yeah. Oh, with officially Wolverine. Yeah. It, oh, it is happening. Speaking of not what. Speaking of, speaking of uh, Ryan Reynolds, I don't know if you – this is not for everyone, but I have to say that I have thoroughly enjoyed so far his uh, documentary, Welcome to Wrexham, where he and uh, the the dude behind uh, Always Sunny in Philadelphia bought a, um, a, a, a soccer team. Yep. And, oh, man, it's gut-wrenching. But at the same time, it's really interesting. And it's on FX. Yeah, I know about it. I watched it was an interview with him, the always sunny guy. Yeah, and then actually Eli Manning. Uh -huh. uh, oh, it was interesting. Was they, were they on like Monday Night Football or something? That wouldn't surprise me. The, the, no, the... it was it was like in a sports bar where they were just basically shooting the shit. Hmm. Uh, but Wrexham came up quite a bit. Yes, because it was oh, obviously Rexham. like an advertisement for Wrexham. Oh yeah, fully. oh my god! The but the 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 hoops that they've had to jump through, and then like the heartache that that team has put them through, it's very expensive to run a soccer team. Um, they yeah. they they, I think in one of the episodes they said that they're uh, if they do not move up uh, a division because yeah. they're they're like in the lowest of the professional divisions. If they do not move up, they are going to be hit for basically $1.25 million in loss. However, if they move Ooh. up, it's a much, they may break even or just lose a little. That's nuts. And oh, by the way, they, that team didn't actually own their own stadium because a previous owner dicked them over. But, 
Uh, if you want to know more, watch the damn show. Well, we might see Ryan Reynolds in more movies to pay for soccer. <laughs> well, it's 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 his movie money and his uh, aviation. Uh, fuck, was it vodka? Whatever his yeah. his yeah. his um, alcohol is. It's it's his it's his movie money and his alcohol money <laughs> that's that's helping fund that team. Well, then you got like The Rock funding XFL for four. Sure. Yeah, I'll succeed at some point. If at first you don't succeed, fail another couple of times. Just keep doing it. it, it, it you know, uh, what is it? Um, uh, um, failing the same way, the same every single time that leads to excellence right not insanity i feel a little bit insane now yes yes okay so um there's one more story and then there's a question that that came up and i'm going to go with the story real quick that is that there is currently a lawsuit that has been filed by atlas which is a uh is basically a name that's synonymous with like uh, JRPGs, Japanese role-playing games. Uh, mm. Some of their titles, um, uh, Shin Megami Tensai is their big one, but I mean, they got a, like, got a fucking library worth of, of really solid games. Now, the reason why there's a lawsuit out there is that they are suing uh, a company for um, basically illegally resurrecting their Shimagami Tensai uh MMO. Okay. So they have been they have not only have they been um I, I'm sure that what they basically just like grabbed all the packets and all that shit to to build their own servers and stuff, but they the thing that I think got them in uh, this this company or these two companies in a shit heap of trouble is the fact that they have um uh, what was it? They changed the was it the copyright? Uh, hold on, let me make sure. Falsely added its own copyright information along with Atlas, Sega, and co-developer Cave Interactive to the website where they're and of course they're uh the, where they're hosting this game. Atlas is basically um despite their own servers being dead for six years. The developer is seeking statutory damages of up to $25,000 per violation of the DMCA, plus monetary relief, including damages sustained by Atlas in an amount not yet determined. Get lard. Now, here's the thing. This is not, this is not a new thing. There are fans out there who have basically figured out a way to keep their favorite MMOs going on their private servers. Uh, but this is the first time that I think a, a company has really gone, you know, just hardcore into lawsuits. Because I know that there's like Matrix Online. There's Matrix Online out there somewhere. There's, uh, was it uh, Star, um, Star Wars Galaxy? The first one, not the second iteration. Well, look at WoW Vanilla. I mean, those were such huge servers that yep. almost like forced Blizzard to come out with the official WoW Blizzard. Um, but it's kind of interesting. I mean, think about in that case, though, like with WoW Vanilla, um, it's not like Blizzard. I mean, I know some got shut down, but they weren't lawsuits like this. Yeah. So what did they do? They came out with a product that basically killed vanilla servers because there was yep. no need to run them because Blizzard had their own. Yep. So legally technically they might be in the right but at the same time i'm also ethically like look if the game has been shut down that long just let the gamers do their own damn thing no, they, okay so so here's the thing i i agree unless see here's here here's where it gets a little tricky if the individuals who are keeping this game alive are receiving monetary uh um it, basically if they're getting paid why not? I mean, at that point, though, the developer to me has basically given up any 
because it's those people hosting the servers taking all the financial risk at that point in terms of hosting the game and assets and I mean, it's not free to host a game. That's why they shut the game down in the first place as a developer. So it's not like it's just magically free. If the developer wants to host the game, then by all means, shut it down. I get that at that point. But if they're not going to take the risk of doing that and somebody else does, I don't see any issue with them making money off of it because they're the ones now taking the risk on that. If you want to make money off of it, then do it. I, I, yes, yes, I agree. There's part of me that agrees with you, Zealus, but then there's also part of me that, as as an individual, I, I I love the fact that there are people out there who who are keeping this IP alive, that they think it's that good that it should continue to survive, and there are people out there that are probably funding these people to help with all the cost of stuff. But at the same time. It wasn't theirs to begin with. And I understand that that you know that part of me says yes. The 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 IP owner gave up on the game. So F them for doing that. But at the same time, there is legal ramifications um behind if their game were to accidentally do something detrimental to someone's uh system or if if someone were to hack it uh and and basically find a way to you know like install malware on all the systems it would go back to them because they would be that the hacker would be utilizing atlas's code um uh, i would actually like to see a precedent for that having happened true I, I, but but the thing is it could happen and because it could happen that's that's the you know that's the big if because i mean l there are some amazing games i would love to see what uh what was, what was the game called wild star online oh, what gosh. it could have potentially been if it actually true because it was supposed to be it was sort of supposed to be kind of like in the same vein as firefly online i'd love to see firefly online as well um but yeah, that I mean, the, the amount of MMOs that crashed and that burned. That was such a hyped game that just crashed and burned. Yeah. It, you know what it kind of reminds me of in a weird way? What's that? The Google situation. Yeah. What I mean by that is you've had a number of MMOs that have crashed and burned, but the ones that tend to stay around, like World of Warcraft, um, Guild Wars, Final Fantasy XIV, they almost have like a... They have money behind it to kind of make it through that initial wave of, wow, this might suck or not work. Like, look what happened with Final Fantasy XIV. Like, the first round was terrible. So it's almost like you have to be able to make it through that and kind of come out the other side. ESO is another great example. Yeah. Um, where um, So ESO is um, Elder Scrolls Online, where ESO was widely panned when it first came out. And it took a couple of years for it to kind of find its feeding and become a... From, I haven't played it since, but my understanding is it's much better than it used to be. So it's almost like it was hot garbage when it first came out. Oh my god! So, you're in a group, you accidentally fall a little bit behind, uh, and then next thing you're you basically keep getting like rubber band into situations that you're ill prepared for. One thing that ESO did make much more popular, which I appreciated, was um, mob tagging, meaning so like. In the olden days of MMOs, a big deal was if you're if I'm Zelius is fighting Hogger and Charlie comes over and he we're not in a party yep. and he helps me kill it because I tag it, I'm the only one who got credit for it. But ESO was one of the first big ones that made it where if we're not in a party and both of us hit it, we both get credit for killing that mob. Which to me is a great, fantastic quality of life improvement. Because dear uh, God, there are so many MMOs out there where there's so many people camped out. Yes. And and okay. there and there's such strategy to get that killing blow in because that's the only way you get credit. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just not fun to me at that point. No. Um yeah. there's an MMO I tried that was actually a lot of fun, but was horrifyingly bad at handling um, you know, basically the death of a mob boss. It's called I want to call it Rose Online. Hmm. Um, it was, it was kind of, it looked more like, 
it looked more Maple Story ish, but like in a in a three oh, D wow. world. Um, it was good. I mean, it was solid. I tried Maple Story and just could not get it. I couldn't figure it out. I was like, this is not. Fun. You know it's you know it's an MMO that that unfortunately was not released uh, internationally. It's only released in a very small uh, section, um, or I guess part of the of the world. And uh, unfortunately, one of the the main pieces of it was it needed user generated content, and that was Dot Hack. Mm-hmm. Had oh. a had an actual online game, where where um, users helped create all those crazy ass dungeons with the three keywords. Oh, um, and I was like, oh my god, yes, yes. And but unfortunately, it it basically it just never really got off the ground. I think it was released in maybe Japan, Indonesia. And one other place, and they're like, "Yeah, we just don't have that much support." I'm like, "Dude, you gotta go everywhere." I would, because I'm, I'm gonna tell you this right now, if that had gone international, I may, ha- I would, I probably would have spent more time in the dungeon builder than actually playing the game, because I love Dot Hack. Holy crap! I tried every single fucking keyword I could think of. You know, but. I- I think that's what actually gets the opposite of that is what gets me bored of MMOs over time. Cause uh-huh. when you do, cause I like dungeons and raiding, yeah. but they become stagnant in the same thing over time. And to me, that was one of the cool things about dot hack. And you know what it actually makes me think of uh-huh. the original Diablo. Yeah. Cause the original Diablo had randomly generated maps and dungeons. With the exception like those- of the boss levels. True. I don't it, remember. Right. No, no. Yeah, it would, it, you would like, uh, was it like the first four levels were ran, were randomly yeah. generated and then you'd have like the butcher level. And oh, yeah, I guess like, it's like a small confined map. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but like that was cool that they were all randomly generated. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, we're 20 years later and like MMOs don't even do, like it's like how much more interesting would like dungeons be if even like just for instance... Like, because really, if you think about it, a lot of like the randomization, even like randomization dot hack was like, where are the islands and how do you turn in the enemies? Yeah. So you could still create like the same difficulty level and types of enemies in the MMO, just even like instead of going straight, right, right, go straight, left, left, forward. Yeah. Like, at least make it somewhat different. So it's not the exact same dungeon every day, all day. It's a little bit old. Um, do I want? God damn it! No, I want to play Dot Hack. I might go back and play some Dot Hack. Uh, if okay. you if you've noticed, I, I did I did re pick up uh, Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven. What? Yep. To give it a spin, I started. Um, I started again. Uh, I did uh, the first playthrough. I did. I started as a nomad. This time, I'm a. Uh, I can't remember what it is. It's basically a street kid, kid who drew, grew up in the streets. Nomads, the guy, the the people who like live out in who are constantly moving and out in the, the wilds. Um, and yeah, uh, sure. It, it technically is a much stabler game, but my God, does it still have some issues? Yes. Um, I somehow continue to do the, I, I got the exact same love story. Um, uh, but, uh, but they did do a small, um, uh, I guess tie in to the anime. Uh, you can get, um, oh balls. I can't remember the main character's name. You can get his coat or his jacket in, uh, the actual game. Um, but, I heard uh, anime is amazing. it's, I, 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 I'm trying to remember what episode I'm on. I, I think I just watched a lot too, like too fast, and there, there, I, I just really, really want to punch the the main character in the face. Uh, I don't know why, but I do. So I took a break because <laughs> I, I was like, I do not need to break anything right now. Uh, yeah. So what's interesting is from what you see, or what I see in Steam is there's actually since the anime came out, mm-hmm. and it's probably somewhat coincidentally with the bug improvements. Mm-hmm. You've actually seen a pretty good uptick of players for um, Cyberpunk. Yep. 
Or, As- also, uh, just also know that um, that Amazon has officially signed on to do a series, uh, Cyberpunk twenty ninety nine, huh. which will happen. It's a story. It's basically in the same universe, but twenty years in the future, or uh, whatever, twenty nine years into the future after the game. But it's kind of funny because you had like the Dota anime come out, mm-hmm. which I think is awesome. Yep. But people are like, yeah, just because you like the Dota anime. Don't go play the game. No. Uh, same thing with League of Legends. Good, great anime. Actually, League of Legends, I think, is one of the best animes on around. Arcane was is amazing, and and it, they need to come bring out another one. But don't go play the game. Whereas Cyberpunk is like great anime. I haven't seen it, but I'll watch it eventually. Go try the game. But, uh, but I think that the big difference, yeah. though, between the two is that in Cyberpunk, the anime, it's the same type of feel in the gameplay. Whereas like Arcane, it's a sto- it it's basically like a story of a couple of the characters, but you're not actually going to interact with those characters in that way in the game. That's true. Actually, you know what I kind of want to replay now is Dragon's Dogma. I think I actually own it, but I don't think I ever played it. Dude. You should play. It's I, it's, I it's actually great. It. It's actually great. Um, RPG in all seriousness. You should play it. I, I think I have it on like the PlayStation 3 or something. It is good. Um, I have it on Switch and I might replay it on the Switch now. Well, there you go. It is tempting. Um, I played a melee character the first time, so maybe magic is the way to go now. Woohoo! All right, ladies and gentlemen, I know that we're like basically out of time. Zealys, do you have time for just one more question? That was a question. All right, we're just going to go with this one. Uh, this was a question that was asked by a fan, and I, I do want to get it in because it, it's a very interesting question, and I want Zeely's opinion on it. Can a player be OP'd, overpowered, in a game difficulty, uh, in one of the higher game difficulties? Should that be allowed? Well, it's two part. Is it depends one on are you OP based on your inventory? Mm-hmm. I guess three part inventory. So yep. stats as far as weapons and armor goes. The second part is OP in terms of stats, like in terms of what is your level and skills. And three, it'd be OP in terms of skill level. Um. And I actually think of Mass Effect is actually, to me, a good example because you can become completely over, overpowered mm-hmm. even at like the insane difficulty because of your stats and level. But the actual skill required to be good at the game is not that high, honestly. Like, to me, Mass Effect is very much a skill-based game, not in terms of human skill, but in terms of the skills your players have. Mm-hmm. So, like, when you get, like, that warp and singularity, like, powered up all the way, you're overpowered. Like, you're a fucking god in that game at that point. Um, which, to me, is actually kind of, to this question's point, to me, the scaling in Mass Effect is not very good, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the game does a lot of things phenomenally, but the scaling of difficulty is actually kind of terrible. Um, especially because you don't actually know what level characters you're fighting, which is always, like, kind of awkward to me yeah um so i would say yes like character enemies should scale better and probably a lot of games honestly like that was just the first one popped to mind but there's a lot of games where enemies don't scale or it's like an awkward um difficulty bump is also super common like regardless of difficulty right i mean it's not uncommon to be playing especially probably like rpgs that are notorious for this where you'll fight like you know random mob one two and three and you face roll them and all of a sudden like you die in two hits to an enemy and you don't know why like especially like classic rpgs like that just happens and you're like huh um so like that's usually like a big complaint in a lot of rpgs is really AI scaling, usually not in terms of AI intelligence, but as far as like the actual difficulty of the fights is definitely it's something to be desired in a number of games, to be honest. Well, I think, you're, I, and I think uh, to answer this question myself, um, 
I think that, of course, it should be more difficult to, if you put the, the thing is, if it's a game where if you put the effort in, you could become overpower, you know, OP, then sure, it doesn't matter the difficulty because if you're willing to put the time in, sure. But at the same time, um, I'm there with you, Zelius, about the, the AI scaling. I think that a lot of games, what they unfortunately do is they, they make it really, really difficult at the beginning, and then the scaling doesn't kind of match up to, I guess, the player intensity to, like, grind or get better. And so, it like, instead of, like, uh, let's just say normal. Let's say that 50% of the game in normal is going to keep you on your toes. But as where as... Um, in um like the hard it should be 75 percent but it's like 70 for it's like 75 percent of the early content and then when you get about halfway if you've really put the effort in to be to kind of get ahead of that curve you're going to be like kind of in the same overpowered situation as you were with normal it's just yes you can't make as many mistakes but still you could still pwn everybody that stands in your way but that's tricky because isn't that kind of the point of grinding in an RPG right. by the no, no, but that's and right. So that's no. what makes it hard. Is I think the question is, that's what makes difficulty um, configurations. I don't know what the yeah. right word is um, difficult. Is you're basically trying to create a difficulty in a game for a wide spectrum of players. Yep. Anywhere from the because let's be honest. No matter what you have to go do, the difficulty people are going to bitch. Yeah. Because I see all the time, what was the game? Um, Skyrim could be beaten in 16 minutes. On yeah, normal. it was um, Outriders, came up with an expansion. Mm -hmm. And people were complaining about the length of time that takes to level up basically to the max level. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of like, you guys would be happy because if it took like a quarter of the time, then you'd be complaining too easy. that you got to the top level too quickly. Right. So it's like, no matter what, people are going to complain. And, you know, people, you know, you got people who play the story straight through mm -hmm. with no side quest who are going to bitch that it's too hard in level because they do no grinding. And you got people, kind of like me, honestly, who do the side quest. Like, man, that was too simple of a game. Well, yeah, because you did every single side quest in the game, so you're 20 levels above everyone else in the game. So that's one place that's actually really hard to balance. Yes. And that's actually why a lot of MMOs have gone the route of basically um, level um, syncing. So, like, whatever level you're in, you're no more than, like, two to three levels above the actual level Anyways, of right. the character. Right. For that exact reason. Yeah. Um, which is a little bit weird to me because it still means you face for everybody. It just takes three hits instead of one, but whatever. Well, if, like uh, the case of point, I'm I'm going to, I'm playing on normal again through cyberpunk. I not, cause I mean, I've taken two day, two years off. Um, but uh, I have like literally today has been basically that magical turning point where I can actually take like seven rounds and just kind of giggle and yeah. then shoot them back. Whereas yeah. at early on seven rounds, I'd be, I'll be hitting the uh, uh, restart at last checkpoint. Uh, it's, it's like this, there's just like yep. this mat. You just, you accumulate just enough. And, but I will say this, the, and, and this is my opinion. This is how I'm playing cyberpunk. You don't have to do this, but my recommendation is that when you level up, you're going to get these, um, I think it's attribute points that you can put towards like uh, physical, uh, tech abilities, uh, hacking, all that stuff. Do not, <laughs> do not put those points in there until you are put in a situation that requires a specific amount. Uh. Uh, and then just do that amount. Because, I, oh my I, God, does I it make the... About. Yeah, it makes the game so much easier to be like, well, if I want to tr truly be able to continue on the way that I want to play, I've got these extra points that I could just go boop because there'll be like options. You could just hit the 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 pause menu and then apply that that stat uh, point right then and there. Jump back in and ta-da! Magically, you could do it now. 
So I'm sitting with like five extra just sitting there. Yeah. Where I, I, I can drop whenever I need to. I RPGs that based on my class automatically assign attribute points for that exact reason. Yeah. So I know it's going to happen in RPGs. So I'd rather like just do the Diablo style where like you assign skills, which is fine. But as far as like what's your strength and dexterity, just automatically assign it. I actually honestly prefer. <laughs> Well, and to be honest with you, the vast majority of those points in, in Cyberpunk really aren't going to do much for you. Uh, mm. The only thing it's going to do is it re you requ it requires like your certain weapons, certain items, uh, certain skills that are yeah. uh, um, hacks that you that you do against your opponents. They require those points, but otherwise, Excellent. you know, don't 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 assign them if you don't have to. That's my that's my two cents. Yep. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have what reached the end of our the Thursday night hangout. Line. This version or this episode of the Ultra Confusion Thursday night hangout. So I want to take a second and thank everyone for tuning in to the Ultra Confusion Thursday night hangout. For myself, Charlie and Zelius, it's been a pleasure giving you to come our heads, our mouths, and of course, our hearts. We'll be back next Thursday for another Ultra Confusion Thursday night hangout. Remember, kids, keep on gaming in the free world. Amen to that, brother.